It is no secret that since the mid-1900s, computers have entered almost every facet of our lives. During that time, one particular measure of progress, transistor density, has faithfully followed Moore's law, which predicts a log-linear relationship over time. However, in recent years, the limit has grown abundantly clear. As transistors enter atomic scales, the laws of quantum mechanics compromise their functionality. Quantum computing is an emergent field that seeks to leverage these unusual quantum properties to our advantage, and the term has certainly sparked popular interest in recent years. Even here on YouTube, collecting the top 50 comments from the top 50 quantum computing videos suggests an overwhelmingly positive reception. However, while quantum computing is often lauded as the future, it has one fatal problem. It's often treated like pop science. This video, or rather series of videos, seeks to clarify the topic by engaging with the mathematics at play. But before getting too ahead of ourselves, we need to talk about classical computing. If you hang around computer folk every now and then, one term that likely pops up in conversation is the bit. These are the things that have snazzy prefixes attached to them when you're purchasing additional storage. A 1 terabyte disk, for example, contains 8 times 10 to the 12 bits. Now, according to Wikipedia, the strict definition looks something like this. I know what you're thinking right now. What the heck is a portmanteau? Okay, let's see. Mm, ah, yes, the blending of two other words. So here, it seems the words binary and digit are relevant somehow. We'll get back to that in a minute, but first, let's focus on the words just above it. Unit of information. I'm sure we all have an intuitive sense of what information is, but can we be more precise with our language here? Information is anything that reduces the space of possibilities. So you may recall that in probability, events can be described with Venn diagrams, and certain cutups can visually describe probabilities. Information acts like a given in this context. If I were to tell you, for example, that event B did not happen, then I reduce the space of possible outcomes. I gave you information. But I think that explanation undermines just how natural information and questions related to it really are. To illustrate, let's take a break and watch a brief clip from Stranger Things. Just avoid all the copyright and fair use issues, click the link on the top right, and come back here when you're finished. Okay, dark as I was, I want you to consider what you just saw strictly from an information perspective. When Joyce was trying to communicate with her son Will, her instinctive reaction was to use a yes or no question. Each time Will responded by turning on the bundle of lights, he cut the space of possibilities in half. In the computer science lingo, we'd say he communicated one bit of information. Since there are only two options to begin with, he effectively told Joyce what she needed to know. This line of reasoning extends to the English language. By the time Will got to R-I-G-H, you could probably guess what he was trying to say because there aren't a lot of words that start with those four letters. In a certain sense, each letter Will provided gave Joyce information because it cut the set of possible words he could be trying to communicate. Now traditionally, computers don't use letters like the English language does. Instead, they use two, namely 0 and 1, physically represented by nanocapacitors. While it might seem that using zeros and ones for everything would be a major handicap, it turns out that the binary system performs quite well. Just like individual characters may not convey information, a group of them forms words which are much more meaningful. Similarly, in computers, we use a group of 8 bits called a byte as a basic block. Each of these bytes can hold up to 256 unique values. But why do we care about bits so much? Well, it turns out that at a fundamental level, all modern computers take information as bits, apply a certain set of rules to them, then provide an output. Let's go ahead and talk about some of those rules. We'll focus on three gates. The NOT gate simply flips the input, so plugging in 1 in green outputs 0 in red, and vice versa. Oftentimes we'll record the possible inputs and their corresponding outputs as a truth table. The AND gate takes two inputs and checks whether they are both 1. If not, it returns 0, otherwise it returns 1. Finally, the OR gate takes two inputs and checks whether one of them is 1. If so, it returns 1, otherwise it returns 0. It's also worth pointing out that it doesn't matter whether we use 0, 1, or true, false as our labels, as long as our choice is limited to two possible states. Now logic gates by themselves are fairly simple, but they become powerful when combined together. 
You can imagine that binary addition, for example, can be decomposed via these binary operations. And once you can add, you can pretty much do anything numeric. In fact, some mad lads in the Minecraft community have actually leveraged the Boolean mechanics of redstone to do some pretty insane things. I highly recommend checking some of them out in your free time. Now, this is the point of the video that really depends on who's watching. Some of you are very familiar with linear algebra and have no problems talking about things like unitary matrices or vector spaces. Others have no idea what those objects are. Here, we're striving for somewhat of a middle ground where we can provide a refresher on relevant topics. That said, the point isn't to be strictly didactic, and if you want a fuller, richer dive, we would recommend checking out the 3 blue one brown Essence of Linear Algebra series. Links and clicky stuff's in the description. As we mentioned a few minutes ago, bits need to be represented by a two-state system. As we'll soon see, one mathematical object called a vector can satisfy that requirement. So what is a vector? Really, there are three different perspectives here. The physicist would view vectors as an arrow in space. This perspective turns out to be enormously useful in mechanics and magnetism, where the superposition of forces pairs nicely with vector addition. More on that in a moment. The computer scientist views vectors as nothing more than a list of numbers to be manipulated and used for a variety of purposes. And the mathematician views vectors more abstractly as objects that obey a certain set of properties. For us, the physicist view will suffice. You'll hopefully come to see that in our use case, it has a certain elegance and visual appeal to it. Okay, so we have an arrow in space. Now, in a physics context, this arrow is defined by magnitude, how long or short it is, and direction, where it points towards. To make the notion of these two quantities a little more concrete, oftentimes we'll impose a coordinate system whose origin is on the tail of that vector. You might be tempted to use polar coordinates here. After all, aren't r and theta the most natural analogs to magnitude and direction? However, for our purposes, the Cartesian plane is the clear choice. It better reflects the operations we can perform. Okay, so we have a pair of vectors, which we'll call a and b. Now these two vectors have x and y components. In order to scale our vector, we multiply each element by a constant we'll call a scalar. We can also add vectors by adding their components element-wise. The geometric intuition is that we're going from the tip of our first vector to the tail of our second vector. But one operation that's of particular importance to us is matrix multiplication. Now, a matrix is nothing more than a table of numbers. When we multiply a matrix by a vector, the idea is that we multiply the rows of our first matrix by the columns of our second matrix element-wise. This of course doesn't strictly apply to 2x2 two two matrices against a 2x1 column vector. In general, as long as your first matrix has as many columns as your second matrix has rows, the product is well defined. Now, one question you may have is why matrix multiplication is defined the way it is. Well, arguably, the greatest motivation stems from linear systems. Here, you can notice how matrix multiplication pairs nicely with the relevant system. Each row of our matrix, what we might call a row vector, corresponds to the coefficients of a linear equation. Let's focus on systems of two linear equations. Here, there are only three options, so let's go ahead and walk through them. 1. No solutions exist, in which case the lines run parallel to each other. 2. One unique solution exists, so the lines intersect at some point. 3. Infinitely many solutions exist, in which case they are in fact the same line. Now when you're solving systems of equations, only one of these outcomes is satisfying, so to say. The issues arise from either contradictory or redundant information, so it'd be nice to check whether those problems arise in an arbitrary linear system. This brings rise to the idea of linear independence. Essentially, if you can find non-zero coefficients that solve a times v1 plus b times v2, etc. equals zero, then that set of vectors is said to be linearly dependent. It's either contradictory or redundant. In practical terms, this means that the system can't be solved uniquely. This idea extends to more, shall we say, abstract cases. 
A vector space is a set of objects which follows a certain set of rules so as to behave the way vectors do. The basis of such a set is the largest set of independent vectors in V. That is, if you add any other element, it would make the system dependent. To make this all a little bit more concrete, consider the Cartesian plane. Its basis vectors, fancily called i hat and j hat, are the x and y axis with unit length. That's just another way of saying that any other vector in this plane can be expressed as the addition of correctly scaled x and y components. One final note here. I want you to consider the following matrix M and vector V. Because i hat and j hat form a basis, we can write V as x times 1 comma 0 and y times 0 comma 1. When we multiply our matrix against that expression, the operation behaves linearly so we can distribute the matrix. Now consider what it means to multiply m against these basis vectors. They essentially act as filters for the first and second columns of our matrix. These columns are then scaled depending on the values of x and y. Visually, you can imagine a transformation of space where the green vector lands on the first column and the red vector lands on the second column. Scaling and adding these two can yield any vector in this new space. At this point, you might be wondering how any of this is relevant to quantum computing. Let's revisit our definition of the bit. Up until now, we said that a bit has two states, either 0 or 1, but consider representing our bit with a vector. Namely, 0 corresponds to the vector 1, 0, and 1 to 0, 1. This might seem strange at first, but when we extend this language to quantum computing in future videos, I think you'll see that it can be quite beautiful. Remember that this is just one of many ways we can represent bits. Alternatively, you might see an abbreviation, which looks something like this. We call this Dirac notation, or bra ket notation. Since we're using column vectors to represent bits, you might have already guessed that matrices represent the logic gates that act on these bits. We'll close with a simple example, the NOT gate. Recall that this gate takes a single bit and flips it. This is the matrix that represents the NOT gate. But don't just take my word for it. In the last chapter, we discussed how each column in the matrix tells us where the corresponding basis lands. Here, we can see that 0 gets transformed into 0, 1, or the 1 vector in our bra ket notation. Similarly, 1 gets transformed into 1, 0, or the 0 vector. Whatever we input, our output is the opposite. That's exactly what the NOT gate is intended to do. In the next video, we'll extend this idea to multiple bits using tensor products, and more so discuss relevant quantum mechanics. But I think we covered enough with the first video. So for now, take care.